All right, good evening. Um, it's good to see you. Are we awake from this week, or are we just like, oh, everything's tiring today? Well, let's get excited, because we're going to be in uh, the book of Ruth. Yay, Yay the book of Ruth. If you turn with me to the book of Ruth tonight. <laughs> you know, we're, we're taking some time to look at some Old, Tes- Old Testament books, and the book of Ruth is a great one. It is one of the sweetest little books that we have in the entire Bible. You know, the book of Ruth, it is a love story. You know, as the narrative follows a Moabite named Ruth who moves to Israel with her mother-in-law, Naomi, after they face tragic losses. And this committed young lady, Ruth, will ultimately marry a faithful and godly man named Boaz. But the book of Ruth is more than just a breathtaking romance. It also has significant meanings for our faith. And for one, it covers the, importance, the important theme of redemption. Redemption is the purchasing back of something that was forfeited or lost. Bo- Boaz would be what is referred to as a kinsman redeemer. He would ultimately buy back the land this family lost when they left the land of Israel. And he serves as a magnificent illustration of what Jesus does for us. Because of sin, our relationship with the Father has been severed. It's been lost, but Jesus, he redeems us. He purchases us back with the most, to the, this precious relationship with God. And he did it by his sacrifice for us upon the cross. Shedding his innocent blood, his priceless blood as he stood in our place. So all of us who believe can be restored to God. And this redemption means just like Ruth is the bride of Boaz, we become the bride of Christ, where we have forgiveness of sins and are promised a glorious inheritance that is waiting for us in eternity. The book of Ruth is also extremely significant because it shows God's providence in accomplishing his will and purpose. You know, God's providence providence is a a theological term that simply means that God is in control. He is in control. God takes natural events and lines everything up for his will to be accomplished. You know, we just got done studying the book of Jonah. And one thing we could see in the book of Jonah is that God was in control, right? Uh, But the way God worked in the book of Jonah was quite different than what we read here in Ruth. In Jonah, God showed he was in control by using his miraculous power to get things accomplished. From the very beginning, when Jonah rebelled and bolted the complete opposite direction, we see God step in by using extraordinary means to get Jonah back on track and answer his call. You know, we read about God supernaturally sending a destructive wind that ultimately caused the crew of the boat to toss the problem prophet overboard. You remember that. Then as Jonah became that human buoy, just bobbing there in the ocean, waiting for what's next, we see our friendly fish, Sholi, come along, right? Swallow him up for for a little bit of time. I love that fish. But we are told that, that the Lord himself prepared supernaturally. He sent this huge fish to swallow Jonah and take him on this open ocean cruise to the land of Nineveh. And it is clear and obvious that God used spectacular and phenomenal events to get his will accomplished there in the book of Jonah. But just as spectacular was what God did here in the book of Ruth. It was just not done in that in-your-face, Red Sea partying, 5,000 people feeding, fiery furnace, saving type of uh, example that we see in Scripture, that we love to see in Scripture. The book of Ruth was still supernatural. God was still just as much in control, but he was using more natural circumstances to accomplish his will, which is how we see God pretty much work in our lives too, right? I mean, do you ever stop and think, like, wait a second. If this occurrence did not happen in my life, then this part of my life would be totally different than what happened. You know, if I never met this person that influenced me to get this job, I would still be doing that other thing. You know, if I never went to that place, I never would have had met my spouse, then had these kids, then moved here, and on and on and on. You know, even for our spiritual lives, maybe it it was this one catastrophic event. If this didn't happen, I never would have looked into reading the Bible or going to church. You know, this tragedy or this event or this conversation is what led me to Jesus. You know, if this didn't happen, I don't even know today if I would ever be a Christian. It was practical, 
but God had his hand in it. It might not have been a miraculous Jonah and Sholi experience, but it was just as supernatural. It was Romans 8, 28 at work. God working all things together for good to fulfill his purpose in our lives. And just like we are to know that God works this way in our personal lives, this is what we see in the book of Ruth. And before we even get into the book, we can know about the impact this one story had on the history of the entire world. You see, it, It is through the events that transpire here that enabled Ruth to go to Bethlehem, where she will marry Boaz. Ruth and Boaz become the parents of Obed. Obed was the father of a man named Jesse. Jesse was the father of a young, ruddy, godly, worshiping shepherd, king of Israel, named David. David was given a promise that through him, the Messiah would come. And that Messiah would come and provide the way of salvation for all who believe in him. So without all the pieces of this true story story fitting together perfectly in alignment, all this could not happen. The book of Ruth is a book about God working supernaturally through natural events to fulfill his will. And as we begin, may we be encouraged to know if God can do all that with this young Gentile woman named Ruth, how easy is it for God to do the same things with us personally? Let's not forget that God is in control. He is working all things together for good in our lives, which means all things. Sometimes those things that he does feel so good. Those are good things. But sometimes those things that are good don't feel so good. Sometimes those things feel horrible. But we can all take comfort in knowing that if we belong to Jesus, we can trust God is doing a work in us. He's doing a work around us. And he's doing a work through us. Amen? God is in control. Pray with me, and then we will study this first chapter of the stunning book of Ruth. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you for this evening together. I pray you would encourage each person here tonight that as we look at this book, that we would, Lord, learn more of your word, Lord, that we would learn the story, but we'd also, you would impact us as well as we look at this and we know that your word never returns void. Lord, but you have a word for us tonight. So would you speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 and 2, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Just in these first couple of verses, we gather quite a lot of information and context into what is taking place. We are told that the events in the book of Ruth took place when judges ruled, which means that this story took place sometime during the book of Judges. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the book of Judges. But this time period was a 350 to 400 year time period. To put it lightly, was a very bad time for the nation of Israel. There was no king at that time, and there was this one disheartening phrase we read in the book of Judges that says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And because everyone did what was right in their own eyes, they all did what they wanted to do. (laughs) And because they all did what they wanted to do, most of the people rebelled against the Lord. And because most of the people rebelled against the Lord, it was a period of time that was full of complete chaos and anarchy. There was this ongoing cycle that occurred. The people would rebel against God, and that led to them falling into oppression by neighboring countries, which led them to crying out to God for help. And of course, God, who is in the saving and restoring business, when they cried out to him, God heard their cry, and he would deliver them from their enemy's affliction. And God would then raise up a judge who was like a real-life superman and one superwoman. (laughs) During, the, during that time to rescue the people. And you'd think after one time, the people would learn their lesson. But no, they kept falling into this cycle over and over for this 350 plus year time period. And I know it's easy for us to say, come on, especially as we look at so much of what Israel did wrong. We say, come on, what's going on? How come they couldn't just get it? But before we knock them, how many of us find ourselves in many cycles of sin and rebellion constantly, 
Or maybe we are walking strong only to get stuck in that bondage of sin or disbelief until we realize how far we drifted. And then we finally cry out to God for help. You know, I'm just thankful that God does restore and forgive because if I only had one chance, I would have lost that a long time ago. Anyone else? You know, our God is in the saving and rescuing business, absolutely. But again, the time period of, was of the book of Judges is when the book of Ruth takes place. But it's so awesome to take note that even in one of the low points in Israel's history, God is still in control and doing a great purpose fulfilling work which is shown in this book of Ruth right here but but taking place at the time of judges was not the only problem going on there was also a severe famine that occurred in the land you know famines were quite normal occurrences at this time and could be caused by droughts and other environmental reasons but according to Deuteronomy 28 the flourishing of the land or lack thereof was connected to Israel's obedience if a nation, if as a nation they obeyed, they and their land would be blessed. But if they were disobedient, they and their land would be cursed. Their sin and rebellion would directly cause the hardships in their life. And we can tell that this must have been a devastating famine because the famine hits Bethlehem of Judah. You might think, well, why is this significant? Because of what these words mean. You know, it's always good to look up the meaning of names because they usually have important meanings. Judah means praise in Hebrew. And the name Bethlehem means house of bread. And we are also told they were Ephrathites. Ephrath is another name for Bethlehem, which means fruitful or fertile. So the area this family lived in was a land of praise where great harvests were expected to take place. It was a place the people could count on crops to sustain them. It was a, a land that was rich in agriculture, a land that flourished. And yet this flourishing land is facing a great famine. In Israel at this time, because of rebellion, even at the location of the house of bread, there was no bread. People were hungry, people were starving, and people were looking for nourishment. And this family this book centers on, experiences all this dryness and decides to bail out of the city of Bethlehem and go to Moab. And in verse two, we are introduced to this family. And just like places have significant meanings, people's names had meanings too. And this patriarch in the family was a man named Elimelech. Now, I do not know anyone named Elimelech, nor I do believe anyone here tonight will be tempted to name their children Elimelech when they are born. I could be wrong. Maybe you dig that name. But this is actually a really good name. Elimelech means my God is the king. That's a pretty good name. My God is the king. Now, I don't like the name Elimelech, but I like my God is the king. That's a, that's a rocking name. You know, during Bible times, parents would often name their kids certain names with the hope that they would live up to the name that they gave them. So you could almost picture when Elimelech's mom was pregnant with him, his parents pulling out the book of best baby names of Old Testament times, landing on this name and then saying, oh, look at this one. My God is the king. You know, we just want our son to follow the Lord and be led by him all the days of his life. Let's name him Elimelech so he can, can aspire to live with God as his king. And this is one reason people gave their kids specific names, so they could aspire to fulfill that name. Other times, children would get their names because of certain qualities the child had when they were born. Naomi means my delight, my joy, or pleasant. And maybe Naomi's pregnancy, or her being in the belly, was an easy one <laughs> compared to others. Maybe no morning sickness with this, this little girl in her belly. Maybe no obscure cravings like ice cream and pickles and all those things that, that make mo moms gain that extra weight during childbearing. Or maybe the pain of labor was not so bad. Maybe it was one of those four-hour labors instead of those, those crazy 72-hour labors that you hear about. So when out popped little Naomi, her parents were like, oh, there's our little girl. That brings us so much delight, so much joy. Let's call her that. Let's call her Naomi because she is so pleasant. 
And so far, these names are good, aren't they? These are good names. My God is the king, pleasant. But what Naomi and Elimelech choose to name their boys, not so great. <laughs> Malon and Chilion's names are quite unfortunate. Malon means sickly, and Chilion means wasting away or puny. You know, I wonder if Elimelech was one of those tough, hard-to-please dads. You know, I picture Naomi so excited, just being pregnant. Hey, here's our firstborn baby. What do you think of him? What shall we name him? Elimelech comes close, looks at him, is utterly disappointed. He goes, that boy don't look too good. (laughs) It's all frail and wrinkly. It's all bald and pale. Let's call this one sickly. Next one born, Naomi's like, Eli, Eli, what should we name him? He doesn't look any better. No definition, no muscles, real small, weak. Let's call this one puny. <laughs> Could you imagine these being your names? You know, you're, you're walking around. What's up, puny? How's your brother? Sickly. <laughs> I do tell you, honestly, it brings me a lot of comfort for my son, Caleb. Uh, you know, me, if you know me and my family, we are all into biblical names. You don't have to be into biblical names. You could still be a good Christian parent and not choose biblical names for your kids, I guess. Um, but we named our kids Caleb, Selah, Luke, and Micah. Biblical names for sure. And I remember, you know, when it's your firstborn kid, you're like, oh, we got to pray about this name. We got to know, you know, know what this name, you're praying and fasting for the right name. And I remember going, Lord, what should we name my, my firstborn son? And I'm praying, and I'm like, Lord, and I felt like he gave me three confirmations, totally clear as day, three confirmations that Caleb was to be his name. And then I learned what Caleb meant. I almost changed my mind. Caleb literally means dog. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I really love that. My kid's name means dog. And then when he found out that his name meant dog, he's like, Dad, my name means dog? And Really? And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're my dog. You're my dog, boy. <laughs> but I tell you what, dog is much better than sickly or puny. And I told him, I told him, hey, I'm going to be talking about you tonight. So if you see him after service or on Sunday morning, you can go up to him and go, what up, dog? He'll, he'll respond to you. <laughs> but, but these were their names, sickly and puny. But back to dad, I don't think Elimelech lived up to his name as that is the goal for parents. I don't think he lived up to his name, my God is king. Because even though there was a famine going on out there in Bethlehem, he really should have stayed in the land of promise and trusted in his king, leaning on him for provision, but he didn't. Once there was difficulty, my God is the king, took matters into his own hands. He left the land of the king and fled to an ungodly nation called Moab. And when I say an ungodly nation, that is putting it a bit too gently. Because do you remember how Moab began? It began from an inappropriate, incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters in a cave. Where in order to preserve the lineage of their name, the daughters got their dad drunk, seduced him, and that first night the eldest daughter became pregnant. And the child born to her was named Moab. The Moabites were enemies of Israel and always a source of trouble for the nation. And not only that, the Moabites were a total and and pagan society who did not follow the true and living God. They were a people whose lives were so displeasing to God, God referred to them in Psalm 108 as my wash pot, which is like saying they are my dirty mop bucket or literally my toilet bowl. This is where this family moved to. Elimelech leads his family straight down the toilet. From the house of bread, God's promised fruitful land of praise to the spiritual dumps. I mean, this is definitely not a good choice. And I think what a learning application for us. You know, even the dry times of life, the times of difficulty and leanness, it's always better to stay close to the Lord. It's always better to draw near to him and remain in a place of promise instead of taking matters into our own hands and heading to a place of spiritual decline. And I get it, it's easy when we go through hard times, it's easy to say, you know what, I am just going to distance myself from God. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this away, I'm gonna stop praying, I'm gonna stop coming to church, that's it, I'm just gonna distance myself from God. I'm out of here. But we all know that out there is pretty much equivalent to the toilet bowl of Moab. It's brutal. When you go out and you live your life in the world, it's just going to bring destruction. 
It's just going to damage you, you further. It's just going to ruin your lives. It's never the right choice to flee from God. It's always better to stay put because when we bail from the place God has us, we will always find ourselves in trouble. And many of us Christians, when we go back and we start fleeing from the presence of God, many of us have experienced just how damaging it is to our spiritual lives. And so does this family. It doesn't take long for trouble to come upon them. In verse three, it says, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Elimelech's decision did not make life better. It ended up bringing death, his own death. But not only his death, also his sons. But before the sons died, they got married. (laughs) They got married, which was something else they should not have done. You know, in the law, God commanded the Israelites not to marry people from pagan nations. But living in this this sinful, God-forsaking land, this family continues to get further away from God and his ways. And unfortunately, all the men in this family pass away. So Elimelech did not live up to his name. But it seems like sickly and puny they do. As they don't make it very far, they die. And left behind to fend for themselves is Naomi and her two Moabite daughters-in-law, Orpah and our lovely main character, Ruth. You know, Orpah, her name can mean girl with a full mane. So maybe she was like a beauty queen. She was just maybe gorgeous. But her name could also mean gazelle. And gazelles are are free and they're swift animals, which might explain her quick exit out of the story in a couple verses. But Ruth, on the other hand, means friendship. And that is definitely true of Ruth. Friendship, this this speaks of commitment, which we, we will see. But just imagine all that's taking place right now, all that Naomi has to go through. You know, they have been in this foreign land for 10 years and there is so much loss. Husband, gone. Sons, gone. No one to call on, no one to protect and help or support. No one to help them make it. They are so far from anyone who knows the Lord and can encourage them spiritually because they are in this horrible place, this ungodly nation. Their situation is tough. Well, what is there to do? Where is there to go from here? It's time to go home. (laughs) Verse six, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. You know, it traveled into the land of Moab to Naomi's ears that there were good things going on in Israel. And I like that phrase, that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. God showed up to take care of his people. You know, the Lord, he, he didn't go to where they were in Moab. He visited, he delivered the people in Israel, the land where he wanted them to stay. He brought bread to the house of bread. Seems like something God will do. That's the land of promise, and that's what he promised to do in that land, and that's what he did. But also notice, this is the first time the Lord is mentioned in the book of Ruth. We didn't start by reading, God led this family into Moab. God called puny and sickly to marry gazelle in friendship. No, it's only here when Naomi hears of what God is doing in Israel that God is mentioned. And with all that, he had to de- all that she had to deal with, Naomi realizes that she made the wrong choice. And because of that, life had become a mess. And what she needs to do now is go back home to the land God promised and gave his people, the land of of their inheritance. And I can't help but relate it to the prodigal son. I mean, it's so similar. You remember the story. The prodigal son had everything at home, everything. His father's house was, was full of so much. There were servants there, not lacking anything. But this man, he wanted his inheritance early so he could live the life he chose, away from the blessings of the family. So he went to a far country, he got the inheritance, went to the far country, and spent all that he had fulfilling the pleasures of the flesh. But after he wasted all he was given and found himself eating slop with the pigs, he came to his senses and realized he made the wrong choice. Dirty, poor, and miserable, he goes, what am I doing here? 
I had everything back home. Even the servants are better cared for at eating better than me. I know what I have to do. I will go home and I will just be a servant in my father's house. And we all know the story. His father does not make him the servant, but gladly brings him in, gives him the robe, gives him the ring, has a feast going for, for him. But the best part has to be that first moment he, he lays eyes on his son. As his son comes back to him, it tells us that the father ran, embraced him. With open arms, he was ready to receive his son back. You know, there are many lessons in that story, but one is that God will always take his children back. Sometimes we do hit rock bottom and feel, that our, feel like our world is falling apart. And maybe sometimes we are the cause of that. Maybe it's not just the hardships of the trials that we're going through. Maybe it's some of the decisions that we have made in our lives. Maybe we have removed ourselves from his covering, from his promises, but there is always a solution for us when we find ourselves there. If we ever find ourselves spiritually dry, heavy with all the problems of life and certainties, unanswered questions, the best place to go to see a great change is to go back home. <laughs> to go back home. And the amazing thing is God will receive us back. This is how magnificent our God is. He will always receive us back. He is so quick to restore and receive us back even when we turn our backs on him. And he will take this family back as well. Yes, they were disobedient. Yes, they left the land and lived in the dump, allowed things in their life that, that they shouldn't have, faced shocking consequences that brought death, but God is not done. And he will still do a work as they return back to the land. In verse seven, it says, therefore she, Naomi, went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So it's time to go home back to the place of praise. It's time to travel about 50 or so miles from Moab, around the Dead Sea, through Jericho, back to the land of Bethlehem, which would take about a week to travel. And it was going to be dangerous and it was going to be scary for sure. There's no defense for these ladies, no protection. It's just them on foot, all alone. But before they get going, Naomi has a conversation with her son's wives. In verse eight, and Naomi said to her da two daughters-in-law, go return to her, to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. They all begin to travel back to Bethlehem and then something clicks for Naomi. She stops and thinks about things and she says to Orpah and Ruth, what are you ladies doing? Why are you coming with me? Go home. You have no obligation to me whatsoever. Your husbands, my sons are dead. You have been great wives, but they are dead. Go live your lives. You're still young. Get married to some non-sickly puny guys. And I hope the Lord blesses you. But go, just don't go with me. In verse 10, and they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. Naomi, you can't do this alone. We have to help you. Verse 11, but Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should, should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they, they were grown? Would you restrain yourself from having husbands? No, daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Naomi is feeling the effects of her family's choice and tries to convince these ladies to stay put, saying, what will you have if you come with me? You know, according to the law, if a woman lost her husband and was left without a son, then the brother of the deceased was to have a child with the widow so the father's name would be passed down. It's kind of strange, I know. But Naomi is like, this ain't gonna happen. There's no one left. What, what are you going to do? Wait until I get married again? And then wait until I get pregnant? And then wait until they are old enough to marry? Uh, you, then you'll be too old. Too old even for a cougar. It's too old. It, it's not gonna work. I'm going back with nothing. And when I get there, 
all that I'll have is, is nothing. I will be poor and alone. And after Naomi says this, Orpah is like, good point. I'll see you later. <laughs> Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Orpah says her goodbyes. But look at Ruth's response in the second part of verse 14. But Ruth clung to her. You know, clung is a great word that paints such a picture of love and commitment. It can mean to stick to or to be joined together. That's what she felt with Naomi. You know, you hear about those special bonds between a mother and their son, a father and their daughter, even a father and a son or a mom and a daughter but not too often with the mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law, right? This might be a greater miracle than the fish in Jonah. I'm just saying. But this was real. Though Ruth's husband was dead, though she was free to stay back, she chose to be with Naomi. And this choice is one of the most enormous choices we see in all of Scripture that we never really consider. You know, this is the choice that allows all the rest of the events to transpire in the book of Ruth, but not only that. As we talked about in the beginning, without Ruth going with Naomi, there is no Ruth in Bethlehem, which means there is no Ruth and Boaz sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. It's not happening, which means there's no David from this lineage and no Christ from this line either. But Ruth's heart for her mother-in-law caused all all these things to come to pass. This is like a big wow as we read this. It is a love story, but it's so much more. It's a Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has good thoughts towards us, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give a future and a hope. It's Romans 8, 20, 28, and we know all things work together for good. Ephesians 2, 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is what God does. Ruth had no idea how important her future was, but it will not only be life-changing, it will be world-changing. In verse 15, it says, And she, Naomi, said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Now, Orpah went back to her people and to her gods. You know, and and this, to me, is, is very disheartening. There's a lot of commentators who will say, you know, it's, 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 it's not, uh, Orpah didn't do anything wrong. This was no big deal. She, she, you know, she didn't do anything wrong. Obviously what Ruth did was fantastic, but what Orpah did was not, too, was not bad in any way. I think it's really bad, to be honest, because you see what it says there? She went back to her people and to her gods. I don't know. What could it, Naomi have offered her? Yeah, Naomi said, I have no sons. I have no possessions when we get home. That is absolutely true. But what she had to offer was salvation. She had salvation. She had the opportunity to teach her about the true and the living God. She might not find a husband when they went back to Bethlehem, but if she went with her, Orpah could know the true and the living God and find purpose for her life. She could be surrounded with God's people. She could attend a biblical church. She could worship the Lord, the true and the living God. It, it would not be so much better than the toilet bowl that she was living in. And I believe this kind of shows the spiritual place Naomi is in at this moment because she let Orpah go. She was actually, we'll see, she was dissuading Ruth as well. She's saying, you stay here. Go with your sister-in-law. But when she could have been like, no, come with me and serve the Lord. So Orpah, gazelle, swiftly gallops off into the Moab sunset, sunset, never to be heard of again. And again, she tries, Naomi tries to convince Ruth to go as well. Do you see that in verse 15? Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Go with her. Don't come with me. It it shows that that Naomi's in this place, this, this really dark place still. But Ruth stayed, and look at these words of Ruth in verse 16. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. I mean, this is such a commitment. It's such beautiful words. Ruth is declaring her allegiance to Naomi. She's willing to leave 
possibly her extended family, if they're still around in Moab. Her, she's, gonna, she's willing to leave her, her hometown, even her people and her culture to follow Naomi. And she is serious. She's, I, I'm not just going along for the ride, dropping you off and heading back here. I'm not waiting till you croak to pack up and return to Moab. This is, this is it for me. I am in it for good. I'm never coming back. I will die in your land. My mind is made up. And the best line there, and your God will be my God. Ruth made a decision for God that day. This is the most beautiful part of this. It's not only that she went with her, but she is going to follow the true and the living God. Give her life to him. This is the greatest hope for us regarding people in our lives, isn't it? That, I mean, I think about my kids, and yes, I want them to have, I want them to be well-educated. I want them to have great jobs. I want them to marry the most beautiful, godly women. But, but more than anything, I want them to say for themselves, my God is your God. The God that you serve, the God that you have given your life to is the God that I am going to follow with my whole life. That's what I want for my kids. And that's what, parents, we need to do that. We need to, to continually emphasize our God in our homes. But, but may that be true of not only our kids. I mean, how many of us have family members who we long for them to say this? I have people in my life, I have people really close to me, family members who I'm like, I just wish they would say, my God is your God. And that they would follow the Lord with their whole hearts. I have friends that I would long to see come to know, know Jesus. I was even just recently messaging someone, one of my closest friends in high school. And I was just like, oh man, Lord, I, I haven't been praying for this person enough. This person uh, that you brought back into my life, I, am, I haven't even touched base since the last time I saw them. But Lord, you want them. And, and I love this person. I desire them to come to know you. Use me. I'm a, I'm a pastor, someone who studies your word. Use my life in any way that you can so that this person would come to know you. How many of us have people in our lives like that that we so desire to come to know the true and the living God and say that same thing? How many family members, how many friends, how many coworkers, how many acquaintances, how many enemies do we have? That if they just said that, they just said that, that their whole lives would change, that they would live a different life than what they are living now. We have such an opportunity to shine to those around us so that they would say that very same thing that your God is my God, to shine and to share with those around us. We, let's not miss out on that opportunity because God wants to use us in great ways to make that true. I find it fascinating that, that Naomi's in this horrible place spiritually and yet Ruth steps up to the plate and she kind of leads the way. And she talks about how faithful, she talks about God. She talks about just what, com what commitment is. This should have been Naomi, but it's, we see it in Ruth. Ruth says, I'm going, don't try and stop me. And I love verse 18. It says, when she, Naomi, saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. <laughs> Naomi's like, okay, I can't argue with that. Let's go. And they start moving. Not verse 19. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened. When they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? It's been a decade since they've been in Bethlehem. And people still know who she is. And what, they, what they're doing is, is being full of excitement, which that word means they're, they're stirred up or they went wild. They went wild when they saw, saw Naomi, Naomi. The people are ecstatic saying, Naomi, we're so glad to see you. It's been so long. How are you? We're so happy you're, you're gonna return. As they ask, is this the pleasant one? And her response, but she said to them, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me bitter. For the Almighty, verse 20, the end, second part of verse 20, has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Naomi's bitterness has led to the wrong conclusion. Because what, what have you been covering? See if you guys, Thursday knows it. God is good. All the time? All right. God is good, but, but she is claiming he's not. 
She's not in this good place spiritually, she, and it shows. It shows in what she says about God and how she is interacting with the people. Just think about where she is now. Naomi returned to the house of bread, the place of fruitful living and fertility. She is living in the place of praise, but she is not full of praise. The one who is called pleasant is very unpleasant. She is bitter and she is resentful. She is home, but home is not really in her yet. And, and, and if, you, if you've noticed, they left when it was a famine, but you, but you know what, what we're going to see is the land is flourishing now. There's no more famine. The people are full of praise. God answered, God provided, but she is still dry and in a spiritual famine and completely down. And I think this is a good question for us. Are any of us in that place? Yes, you are here tonight, but maybe you're not here tonight. Maybe you're home, but you're not really home. How do you know you're, you're, you're at home spiritually? You know that when you have joy in your hearts. You know that when you are satisfied with the Lord. You know that when the dryness ceases. I believe you, you can know where you're at spiritually by how you respond to the things of God and how you respond to his people. You know, it's not every day you're going to have a smile just pasted on your face and you're gonna walk around passionately, come to church with all these verses on your mind, lifting your hands in praise. That's not gonna happen all the time because we get tired. We go through things. We face heavy burdens and trials that weigh us down. There are, there are times for sure that that's going to happen. But if those times are all the time, that's a problem. That's a huge problem spiritually. And we have, we have become dry. And that's not where God wants us to be. Again, yes, there's going to be trials. Yes, there's going to be heaviness, but God wants to lift us up. He wants to give us that abundant life. You know what that means. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come to give life and life more abundantly. What that means is a life that's overflowing. Not goosebumps, but a life that is filled with joy. You know, we talk about that a lot. In Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. Obviously, that's in eternity. Obviously, it'll be fully realized when we're in heaven, but we get to experience it now. Fullness of joy. Get to experience the God of all comfort who promises to comfort you. And you get to experience the body of Christ. You know, I think this last year, especially those early months when we didn't get to see each other all that time, it, it remind, I, it, so many of us are reminded just how important it is to be around each other. Just how important it is to not be in isolation anymore. How important it is to, to bear one another's burdens and for them to bear ours. That's what the body of Christ is all about. It's about, it's about being around each other, listening. You know, we talked about that on Sunday, how we get to listen, how we get to set time apart for the Lord, but he even uses his people. He gifts his people in certain ways, and he might want to speak to you, encourage you through his people. You know, the body of Christ is amazing. A few weeks ago, Joe covered Psalm 34, and and people are like, oh, Psalm 34, that's not a very common one. Psalm 34 is actually one of my favorite psalms, and especially at the beginning. In Psalm 34, the first three verses say this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. And this is my favorite verse. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I just picture David just going, come with me. What's wrong? Why are you so heavy? Come, let's magnify his name together. In his, his house, there is joy. In the place of promise, there's blessing. Come and sing out to him. Come be filled with him. He's going to fill you. He will encourage your life. Come on, come to the house of the Lord. And I tell you, there's sometimes I am like, I'm exhausted. There's times I'm discouraged. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't know if I have anything to tell your people today. And I walk through these doors downstairs and everything changes. I, I tell you everything changes. I hear some laughs going on upstairs. And then I walk up and then there's joy and there's family here. I'm like, Lord, I'm amazed. And I get inspired to come up here. 
I get inspired to worship the Lord. You know, when the praise team starts singing songs, I'm like, yes, this is what it's about. It's about being in your presence. It's about being filled because out there, it's a waste. Out there's a toilet bowl and I feel it. I get flushed down every week. I need to come back up and get washed off, get clean. And that's what we get to do. That's what God wants for us. And, and that will sustain us through those hard times when we go out there. When we go out there and everything bombards us and hits us and stinks, we come back in here and we get refreshed. We get washed by the water of the word. We, we see each other. We know that we're not alone in this. And God's word will touch us. I believe it. I believe that God's word is always there to encourage us in different ways. Maybe something you hear tonight is something different than someone else needed to hear. But I believe as we go through this, God speaks. And he wants to do great and awesome things in our lives. And, 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 it's, and what we need to do is go into the house of bread. <laughs> go into the place of praise. Lift, cry out to him and watch how he meets us. But if we distance ourselves from him, if we cut ourselves off and, and we say, my God is the king, and then we don't make him the king, then we're gonna find ourselves in trouble. The good thing is we get to come back. If, if we do it, which we do do that, we get to come back into his presence again. And that's where we will, we will know that he will embrace us like that prodigal's dad just grabbed hold. He will grab hold of us and he will encourage us and build us up. And so I just encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. And that, that's kind of what's happening here. Naomi is in this, this wretched place spiritually. She is down. She didn't even want to bring her daughters-in-law with her, but they came. They came, and, and, and then when she's in the land, she's grumpy towards those people who are excited to see her, and yet she's in the land, and, and she's still down, but, but it's going to change real soon. Next chapter, we're going to see it's going to change. But in verse 22, it says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of a barley harvest. Now, I, I love this because obviously this family went through a lot. Obviously, they had devastating things happen to them. And she's not in a good place spiritually, but she's there at the beginning of a harvest. She came to this place where she, she just, she's going to experience this abundance, this fruitful life start happening again. And I think that's an encouragement for us. Maybe we are heavy. Maybe we are spiritually down. We need to just return to that first love experience. Return to the simple things and watch what God does because he will, he will make a harvest happen in our lives. It will be fruitful. It will be powerful if we continue to trust in the Lord. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this night in your presence. And I just thank you for my brothers and sisters who are always so encouraging, Lord, just to, that, they, that they're hungry for your word, Lord, that they're here to receive what you have for them. And I pray that we would allow you to do great and awesome things in our hearts, in our lives. God, and I do pray if anyone is just spiritually heavy right now, Lord, going through it, that you would lift them up, that you would bless them immensely, that they would know who to run to, and that you are always good, that you are always faithful, and that you will grab hold of us. So I thank you, God, so much for your power, for you supernaturally working in our lives, even in the practical ways. Just continually bless this book as we go through it, Lord, as, as we study it. And thank you so much for your word, which does, it, it, it just, it, it helps our faith, Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. And I pray we would know that and be encouraged tonight. Lord, with, with everything that's thrown at us in this world, we have you. We have your word. We have your Holy Spirit. We have each other. So I pray that we would, we would just cling to you. Cling to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. He is good. Let's Why don't you guys stand with us as we sing this?